So Dr. Bober, you are the director of the Sexual Health Program, Pediatric Oncology at Dana-Farber, which is affiliated with Harvard. And up until now, we've been speaking with a lot of physicians about the clinical component of sexuality as it relates to cancer. But your specific area, which intrigues me a lot, is the psycho-oncology area. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking a lot about the fact that physicians don't necessarily do such a great job in, in counseling and before they start their treatment and medical oncologists even addressing the area of sexuality. Yep. So talk to us. I think that that's very true. You know, I think clinicians really don't uh, get any training about how to do this. Most. And someone said two hours of medical school training, that's about it. Well, I can tell you that uh, at Harvard Medical School, they do, a, they do something in a third year endocrine module for about a couple of hours. But, um, you know, we, we recently finished a study with uh, primary care physicians asking them about um, caring for cancer survivors, including sexuality and fertility. And the majority said they didn't feel prepared uh, to do that although they wanted to. So I think that uh, there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of um, giving people a sense of comfort and people a sense of confidence that they can bring up the topic. And your particular area of interest really happens to be the high-risk women who, who mm -hmm. like myself, mm -hmm. have the BRCA mutation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are you doing there? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, the women who have the uh, BRCA mutations um, are, as you know, very high risk for breast and ovarian cancer. And the uh, primary risk reduction strategies that we think about with these women beyond surveillance in terms of actually preventing cancer is to essentially have surgery where they um, remove breasts and ovaries, which, you know, on the surface sounds pretty drastic. Um, we also know the good news is that it prevents cancer. 90% uh, or more of that risk is gone once you have that surgery. But there are profound implications for uh, sexuality, self-image, relationships, um, all kinds of things related to that. So um, unfortunately, these women don't get, I think, the same kind of attention that women get who have cancer uh, because they don't. Um, and that's another, I think, complication where women have these surgeries and are often feeling very isolated. And even before surgery, the issue of, of, of even deciding, am I going to do the surgery, mm -hmm. in the same breath comes up so many times is the concern of what's going to happen to my sexuality, how will I feel as a woman, and I think that it clouds decision making mm -hmm. and fear mm -hmm. and anticipation mm -hmm. over power, mm -hmm. sometimes what's the right thing to do. Yeah. I mean, how could it not, right? And I, and I think that's one of the... Um, I think that's one of the reasons that I do what I do. What partly drives me every day is that women often make decisions not to do certain things because of the fear that there'll be side effects that they can't manage or they feel that they will be damaged in a way um, that is uh, not deal, they can't deal with it. And that's a shame because I think many of the issues related to sexuality and self-image and self-esteem are treatable. You know, they are things that uh, people can't, there are tools in the toolkit that we have, both psychological and medical, um, to help women regain a sense of themselves, to have a renewal of sexuality and of vitality. And that's very important to give them that message. And it also is essential that women choose physicians who won't negate this, mm -hmm. but will engage in the discussion mm -hmm. in a partnership. I think that's right. Um, you know, there are resources out there. Part of what often strikes me is that there's a disconnect between the resources out there and the folks who need it. So, for example, you know, there may well be um, a therapist, a support group, a written resource. I mean, something that would actually give women a sense of confidence and information, but she doesn't have access to it. So, uh, and that's the case with clinicians as well. What are the bullet points a woman who's listening, who's about to you know, embark on a life-saving prophylactic intervention, let's say, one of these BRCA patients, what advice do you give them as to the key questions they should address with their physicians before 
they have treatment, or before their surgery, rather? Well, I think that women certainly can ask directly, how will this affect my sexuality? How is this going to impact sexuality? But I also think that um, often clinicians, as we just alluded to, might not know the full answer to that. Um, we know that putting a young woman into surgically induced menopause um, is going to potentially face everything from vaginal dryness to loss of libido to lack of self-esteem around body image, etc. And a clinician, a surgeon, for example, might not know how to deal with that. But what I would say is that female sexuality is complicated. That's the good news and the bad news. The good news is that um, it's not just about hormones. We know that female sexuality is much more than that. So that when women feel that, for example, going into early menopause, this necessarily means that it's going to end my sex life for good or that I'm never going to feel like a woman again, that's a sort of a, a simplification um, because the reality is that women can have um, I mean, women, postmenopausal women, can really have an enormous sense of satisfaction and pleasure and sexual connection without the hormones that we see in a younger woman. And that's the case whether you're 30 or whether you're 70. So, you know, it's important that women know that there are resources, that there are uh, clinicians, written resources, support groups, sex therapists who can really help them reconnect with sexuality even if their, for example, gynecologic surgeon or oncologist is not here herself aware of those resources. And what are the best ways in which a woman can speak to her partner? Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, partners like patients often are looking into something that feels like a big black space. They're not sure what to expect. Partners don't know how to support each other. Partners typically are concerned about protecting each other and are afraid of hurting each other. Um, I think that it's very important for a woman going through risk reduction surgery to be able to keep communicating with her partner. That's probably the most important part of this, is that you don't want to stop talking about it. You don't want to have it be the elephant in the room where you haven't had sex for a month, then two months, and all of a sudden six months have gone by, and nobody knows how to start, nobody knows where to begin. But the most important part of uh, uh, sort of ongoing sexual satisfaction within a couple uh, actually has more to do with the communication and the quality of the relationship than the specific parts or the biology. It's very important that they have that channel of communication open from before the process through the process. And one last question. Any advice as far as the types of discussion a woman should have with her medical oncologist before embarking on cancer treatment? I think a woman should be talking with, well, and very specifically, I think a woman, if you're looking at a woman who is considering prophylactic oophorectomy, that's having your ovaries removed um, for preventive reasons, I think a woman should be talking with her doctor about potentially using um, hormone replacement, whether that um, specifically is local or vaginal replacement for um, getting that tissue elasticity back to what it was before surgery. There are many behavioral options she should be looking into to increase blood flow to that vaginal tissue. She should be using a vaginal moisturizer in addition to a lubricant. These are all tools in the toolkit to sense keep that engine running. And that it's very important that a woman does not wait until many months or years have gone by and then she's sort of stuck with sexual dysfunction, but that she's proactive so that we're looking at vaginal health as part of overall health and that we're looking at a regimen of keeping yourself healthy from the beginning so that this is something you start as soon as you have surgery. Um, I think that's very important and I would say that again, you don't want to wait until you have a problem, although you can certainly deal with it later. It's typically a more complicated problem when um, months or years have gone by. Has there been a great lesson that in the years that you've worked in this very intimate area with patients that you have walked away with, a, a memory, a, a statement that someone made to you, something you've learned from your experience with? Sure. Um, I think what I've come to realize is that, especially for um, women who are mutation carriers, young women, there's a real sense, not just of sadness, but of anger, that people haven't paid attention to this aspect of their experience, and that they feel that they've not just saved their life, and they feel grateful for that, but they simultaneously feel angry. They really had to give up a lot in order to have that guarantee of long life, and that unless we address the quality of life issues and pay as much attention to that as we pay to the sort of measures for life saving, um, then we're really, it's, I'm not so sure it's worth it.
and that they, we really have to sort of give both equal um, focus. And so what I take away from speaking with you, it's both how we interpret our experience and then how we integrate mm -hmm. our experience into our lives. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I guess I would just add that, um, and I say to women all the time, you know, sexuality is never a static experience. There are changes and there are, it is a dynamic quality over our lifetime. Um, sexuality at 20 doesn't look the same at 40 or 60 or 80 under any circumstance. Sometimes when we have, you know, more severe measures, life-saving measures, surgeries, there's a kind of a compression and sort of things happen quickly and you might be dealing with something at 30 you didn't expect to deal with at 45, so 45 or 55, but it doesn't mean that this is necessarily the kiss of death. It just means that you have to take a proactive approach. You have to look at sexuality as something that you can't take for granted, but that you have to might um, really put effort into and sort of be mindful about it. But the outcome, the opportunity to enhance pleasure and to have sexual function really be continue to be um, a significant and life-affirming part of your day-to-day -day experience is still intact. The kiss of life. I would say so. Thank you. Okay, thank you.